Hello, everybody, and welcome to a special 10th anniversary edition of Moons and Mythos uh, with myself, David Farrell, your host, and my delightful co-host, Kelly Hunter. Hi, Kelly. How are you doing? Hi. Hola. Doing well. Doing well. Yes. Spring is here in the Northern Hemisphere. Yay. Finally, right? I've been hearing from many people that they weren't sure if the spring was ever going to arrive, particularly up in the, the north of the US and Canada, where they've even had snow until recently. So... Uh, happy to hear that spring is uh, finally finding its way to all you folks way up north and that maybe uh, some of the plants that we love are also starting to appear now, right? Dandelions all over my yard. Dandelion is the boss and I may find a way to slip him in as always into most podcasts today. I, I feel like Dandelion is very much part of the story right now. But today we're going to be looking at the upcoming moon cycles as always. And we have a very, very powerful new moon coming up oh, on yeah. Friday the 19th of May. 28 degrees of Taurus, and then we have a full moon uh, in Sagittarius at 13 degrees. So I know that behind the scenes we were chatting, this is uh, two big moons for both of us. We have big placements on both this new moon and full moon. But um, where would you like to start, Kelly? I know we've it's been a rock and roll kind of a period for all of us, and uh, I, I feel that this could be a turning point this week. It feels like finally we might be able to really let go into those big plans that we've been making, right? And maybe this is the new moon to launch that. Well, it's a potent new moon and we're going to focus on the Grand Cross. I'll bring the chart up. And uh, this Grand Cross is like a sustained cross, which definitely I've been calling a tipping point. So mm -hmm. um, can I share my screen? And here we go. Well, you've been calling this a cuspy, right? And, and you know, that's yeah. the nature of the, the chart. But we could also say it's the cusp of the new earth. It's the cusp of the end of the old paradigm. And, you know, this is not a show where we get too much into the rabbit holes. But for sure, there's been some big news this week. And I feel like it's only going to keep expanding with this Jupiter entering Taurus today. We are recording today on Tuesday, yeah. uh, the 17th of May. And Venus entered Taurus today. So I think we can feel pretty, sorry, Jupiter entered Taurus today. So I think we can feel pretty good about that, right? Yes, uh, that is on the ground. It's happening. Whatever's happening, it's and it's big. And then that's one of the things. Yeah, Jupiter is the big news because it only changes sign every year. Wow. And this is going to take us well into 2024. And also it's squaring Pluto very closely, zero to zero degrees on this new moon on Friday the 19th. So this is this anything with Jupiter is big. And if it makes Pluto bigger, which is still just into Aquarius for another month or so, and it's the new energy, uh, something is opening up and Jupiter's open that door even wider for a literal results on the ground. That's Taurus. And we've also got Mercury in Taurus forward now. You know, remember that Mercury went retrograde just before it got to Uranus. And in this moon cycle, it's going to be on Uranus or just, you know, starting the next moon cycle. So that is a big deal. Oh. And the nodes of North Node in Taurus, which is our collective leading edge of growth, our line of destiny, and Jupiter's amplifying that. That is fabulous. Yeah. Oh. And this all very textured. Taurus is literal. It's it's like feet on the ground. It's like hugging a tree. It also relates to belief systems, which I think might be part of the challenge of the Pluto. Uh, so here we see, here's the, the Jupiter and it's squaring Pluto. And so you know, Pluto is very just in, in a positive sense, it takes down what is no longer life giving and vital. And it's gone into Aquarius. So it started to, to into its new energy. And Jupiter says, keep going, Pluto, uh, except we can't keep going unless we know what's going on. And I think that's part of this as well. And Jupiter has to do with belief systems, which in Taurus, can get a little stuck, you know, Taurus can get a little stubborn minded. And, you know, if we've been living in a certain way for however many centuries or even millennia, you know, this is how it is, right? And Pluto is like sending out some fireworks and it's gonna, you know, kind of some of the destruction is gonna be a pile of belief systems that, that we used to have. <laughs> 
right? And one of the biggest ones that I've heard over the years is like, uh, why are you wasting your time? Nothing ever changes. And, and that's the mantra that we've all swallowed so that we keep just sucking up a load of crap, really. And, and now maybe we don't want to do that anymore. And maybe the people that were doing that are about to experience what it's like when the boot is on the other foot. Uh, and so I think in all of that, those belief systems have to crumble, right? The belief systems about pretty much everything that's unfolding this yes. week. Yes, and, <laughs> and it's literal too. I mean, this is about, right. we're gonna learn a lot from the earth herself, right. where there are gonna be new discoveries. I think that, you know, things that we believe forever, you know, even about our history, you know, are going to change. So this is going to be very interesting. What is discovered, what the earth brings forth, you know, in, in terms of, um, of newness. And but also imagine if we find um, old relics or old sacred sites or old information that radically changes as humans' perceptions of our own history. And for sure, that's one of the big belief systems that mm -hmm. I feel is likely to crumble in the coming weeks, months, and even the next few years, which is the belief system of believing what we've been told about our own history. Yeah. This is well, a, Graham, uh, you know, um, Graham Hancock and mm -hmm. Greg Braden have been doing a lot of talking about that lately. You know, especially Graham Hancock has been on that trail for quite a long time, along with others. Sure. And there's been uh, some some new civilization uh, uh, constantly being discovered, it seems like. Right. And even here in Mexico, you know, with the building of the uh, the Maya train there, every time they go two or three meters down the track where they're laying it, they find another ancient site. And, you know, me and uh, Bella have been exploring a lot about the history of Mexico recently and particularly the period of the conquistadors and what happened during the 1500s. And because of the work we did with Hidalgo, we've been radically reviewing uh, yeah. possibly some of what happened across the world during that period in the 1500s and, and wondering what, how much of what we've been told is even true. So this is a big shattering of many systems, including our belief systems, right, uh, that we, I think, are going to see with this Grand Cross. Because Tell us about the, the nature of a fixed Grand Cross, Kelly, and what it can cause to come up for us. So um, a cross, that we're dealing with two oppositions mm -hmm. and four squares. <laughs> and so they're all in the same modality, usually. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at fixed signs. So there's cardinal, which is inventive, leading edge, new. There is um, the fixed, which is sustaining, keeping things going, going deeper and deeper and deeper. And then there's mutable, which is more the harvest, the muter, the changeability, finishing a cycle and moving into another theme or whatever that is. So this is basically fixed. Taurus is a fixed sign. It's the most stable earth except when Uranus is there. <laughs> so um, and that's what's happening now. So we're, we're going to dig down more, you know, we're going to dig down more. Um, and then, so we have it squaring Pluto, which is in the fixed sign, the fixed air sign of Aquarius. So this can be a uh, fixity of ideas, perspectives, um, and it can be very um, intellectually brilliant. Um, but it can get fixed on the theory and not, you know, there we need the Taurus to be on the ground with it. Okay, here's what we're thinking. Here's our perspective, but does it work on the ground? And that's part of the square here. Because some people, you know, uh, if you're going into the, you know, artificial intelligence route, um, what does that mean in relation to our grounded embodiment and the organic world? And, can, you know, we have, you know, we're going to have to work to find a, a good sink there. So this is, um, you know, part of the amplification of the different pathways that could be taken. And, and this isn't, again, it's not new and inventive. Fixed signs go deeper to what is already there, which is why I think what you two are saying about discovering new civilizations underground is really mm. relevant. Yeah. And then we have um, we have the nodes in in Taurus, and so we are going for uh, the embodiment. That's my favorite word <laughs> with uh, with Taurus right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have that uh, the South Node in Scorpio. So that's a fixed sign that is water. It's like the phrase "still waters run deep," or the power of water to you know, wear away stone over time, you know, it's relentless. And we have 
Haumea has been circling, you know, has been kind of accompanying that south node. Though she's cool. been in Scorpio, but she's back in Libra now, and she's visiting the place where we had the lovely special Venus star point last October. So there's an evocation of that, that moment of high aesthetic and, and a kind of choices being offered. So we have another choice point here informed by, you know, this new Jupiter saying, hey, here's more reality, you know? And so what do we need to let go of? And in order to bring, to have a better choice, to bring more aesthetic, more value into our experience. What I find interesting about this grand cross and to add to what you've just been saying there, is even though um, it's kind of, well, I mean, it's it's fixed, so it's also, it, it relates into the sign of Scorpio, but this is a very scorpionic uh, fixed grand cross because you have Pluto and uh, Mars on either side creating a tension, and then you have the south node in Scorpio, the past. And when we were looking at this chart earlier in the week, what we saw very clearly was almost like a crossbow, you know, with the tip uh, of the arrow pointing towards the north node in Taurus, but with Jupiter on the tip of the arrow, and the sort of the, the axis from which we're coming from, the releasing of the past, the releasing of old paradigms, belief systems, the scorpionic stuff where the south node is, but with the trajectory and with this beautiful Jupiter energy this week of heading towards the north node in Taurus from the ground up. But in the meantime, we have to balance the, the, the sort of the rulers of Scorpio, Pluto and Mars, uh, who are sort of opposing yeah. each other. But if we can, then we've got that incredible sort of, uh, how to say, tension point at the point at which the arrow can be released and that arrow that's pointing towards the north nodes in Jupiter can suddenly be let fly you know a bit like we say the the arrow on the full moon in Sagittarius which is the archer there we go booyaka so I just yeah. wanted to add that in because that was a useful kind of visual that uh, myself and Bella came up with this week to kind of uh, give ourselves a focus point to really work with yes. this moon and this uh, Jupiter energy so do you have any, any comments that you'd like to say around that uh about the arrow well yeah just uh, and also maybe if you can give some more um insight into the 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 opposition between pluto and mars and that sort of and their placements right now and that sort of more school yeah well there bring. we have yeah that's the fourth point of this grand cross which is mars at the very last degree of cancer mm -hmm. so the next day on the 20th it goes into leo and it's going to be right opposite pluto right square jupiter and, you know, how May is like hovering at that cusp and, and, you know, all the nodes are there, which is the destiny. This is the tipping point energy. Just Pluto squaring the node says that, but this goes <coughs> deeper and more profound with that. Now, Mars opposite Pluto is pretty volcanic. <laughs> very eruptive and so is how maya rules she's the mother of pele the volcano goddess and okay. scorpio you know something stirring from very deep yeah the thing is it's about enrichment that's one of a beautiful Jupiter mm -hmm. in taurus word to use wow. and that can get literal in terms of the financial um situation which is both you know falling apart and from the ashes will rise the phoenix. Right. So Mars also can be very militant, you know, especially when we, you know, look at it opposite Pluto. So that can be uh, the the downs uh, the downside or the upside of it. But there, um, when it goes into Leo, it's also going to evoke the leadership quality of Leo and the heart quality of Leo. So, um, yeah, so, so that, that, you know, that is a tough and really angry opposition a lot of times, Pluto Mars. So I think there's going to be a little polarity, especially when we get into the Gemini time frame of, mm -hmm. of this, how this energy is being expressed because expressed it will be Mars and Leo. Leo is a sign of self-expression. The black moon is basically there and Venus is gonna go in there a couple of days after the full moon and be in there for quite an extended period of time and going retrograde there. So there's gonna be a lot of expressive energy, especially 
you know, in June into July a bit when both Mars and Venus are in uh, Leo. And the, the interesting thing is that dance between Mars and Venus, the masculine and the feminine, you know, we see Mars at 29 Cancer now on the full moon, Venus will be there. And they don't quite hook up. And Venus slows down while Mars is still moving forward because she's going to go retrograde. She says, I'm not ready for you yet, Mars. I got to <laughs> I got to come back to myself. I need some me time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nice. I like that. Nice, Kelly. And so, I mean, you know, just to review a little bit of the last few days, I, I kind of felt some of that Mars energy kicking in yesterday, even yesterday morning, like woke up to the news um, coming out of the US about the investigation into the president. Then we have all of the information from the Durham report investigating uh -huh. the FBI. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, and also there's been a big piece here in Mexico over the last 24 hours because the Senator Kennedy came out with some pretty, I think, silly comments while he was um, cross-examining one of the FBI people in the committee. And rightly, I think Mexico has responded quite angrily to unhelpful comments. So it's all getting very fired up, people speaking without thinking. I mean, yeah. the point that Kennedy was making were valid, and I think overall what he was saying was correct, but the way he expressed it, and anyone who's seen that video will probably know what I'm talking about, is not going to be very helpful not, for Nate he, he has a wild sense of humour. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping that he has a wild sense of humor that he's been misunderstood, or maybe it could be a deliberate poking of the bear because there's a lot of tension, oh. let's just say, between the borders now between uh, the North American countries, Canada to the US, US to Mexico. There's a lot of tension around all of them. And I see that this Mars energy is part of that expression. Uh, yeah, it can get a little trigger happy, can Mars. And in Cancer, it's still in Cancer. It can be defensive. It, you know, I'm going to shoot first, look later, you know. <laughs> Uh, it, but it is defensive and protective. That's the beautiful part of it. It's protective. So in a sense, borders are a protection. You know, it's like it's like the the membrane around the cell that gives the cell a kind of integrity. Um, so yeah, but yeah, going into Leo is it's going to be a dramatic change, one way or another. And you know, on a new moon. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's really a, a big part of this moon cycle, how this energy is moving uh, in relation to Pluto and and Jupiter. It's all big change happening yeah. like, whoa, you know, and then how Mayo also has a destructive side. And I've been I've been contemplating how Maya as a yeah, you know, she's the Hawaiian goddess of childbirth. And I've been uh, getting into some studies of sacred womb work and the holy womb of the divine mother. And so I'm starting to see how Maya now as a, a beautiful uh, expression of the divine mother and her capacity to give birth from, uh, from this like special place that is not, um, it's like the galactic center. I think you might have wanted to bring that in to have one of these minutes, maybe when we get to the full moon. But mm -hmm. I think that the, the, the galactic center and the black hole, W-H-O-L-E, at this, you know, in that galactic center as being the, the galactic womb, you know, where Shiva Shakti yes. dance, you know. So that's part of the Holy Mother's um, world as well. And she gives birth to everything including what we might judge as the good or the bad, you know, mm -hmm. as the destructive as well as the, the new birth. You, you need to destroy something in order to recycle and give new birth. And it's not a negative thing, and we think it is. So here's Pluto doing its job and saying, okay, we're stripping this old system down. And how may is, let's make this one much more harmonious, much more fair for everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and when she goes back into Scorpio, gosh, and I forget when that is in November, I think she's going to be all about it. Right. Well, look, you know, there's a couple of really beautiful things you said there, which I just want to loop back to. And 
Um, you know, with this new moon energy um, uh, on Friday with Jupiter and all of the things that we've just been talking about, the emphasis on, I think, the, the goddess energy and the great divine womb is really important. And actually, I just want to take this opportunity to share that we're going to be um, putting out our magic and manifestation workshop on this Friday to talk about how we've been working with these energies um you know over the last uh like 12 months really uh, as as a sort of a process of manifestation through working with astrology and being in the present moment but you know working with the manifestation plants like mugwort and mug uh, and ladies mantle and fireweed you know we can start to work on our own womb space so that we can birth in conjunction with the divine mother uh, yeah you know so sorry i'm just uh, being slightly distracted my cat's been right next to me doing some very strange body movements and i hope she isn't about to be sick on my laptop because that's what it looks like so if i'm looking slightly disturbed that's the reason why so sorry everybody uh, um but you know i just want to bring back in the video that we did recently uh, which maybe not all of our audience have seen oh, yeah. which was the centaur hidalgo because all of what we yeah. talked about is very very relevant for this um fixed grand cross because it's also you know he had his nodes almost in exactly the same place they are now and also on top of that, he went under the banner of the goddess. And I feel that what we're really going to go through as a process, and it's really vital that we do, is the restoration of the goddess energy, the restoration of the divine feminine, and also the restoration of the sacred masculine. Uh, and for too long, too many fingers have been pointed from both directions, saying that the other was to blame. And in the end, we all need to look at ourselves. And, yeah. And in okay, fact, now, the, this goes, you know, we haven't looked at the, at the, the moon and sun yet at 28 Taurus because uh, what you brought up and especially for anyone interested in Mexico or the history of Mexico and what's coming up for the Americas you know this is the Hidalgo and I got excited because it was the really the first centaur object discovered well before Chiron but in any case we have a couple of power powerful feminine archetypes right with sandwiching that new moon at 28 and a half Taurus mm -hmm. and one of those is Al Gol here's uh, Al Gol in Arabic which a lot of star names are means the demon yeah and it marks the uh, star in the constellation Perseus that's part of the head of Medusa and it's her eye her eye that is very potent and um oh where's that wonderful quote i have about her this eye of medusa that paralyzes right the baleful eye of medusa mm -hmm. she looks with an objectivity like that of nature itself and our dreams boring into the soul to find the naked truth to see reality beneath all its myriad forms and the illusions and defenses it displays and there's the divine mother too because she is maya she creates the play and the illusions and then she confronts you with them and you have to strip them down you know so we're being confronted with this mirror of the the eye of the goddess you know that has a bad reputation because of its power because of its transformative and potentially destructive aspect she like looks right at us right through us and there it is you know we've got to look at ourselves and see that nakedness of the soul you know that wants to come through you know every you know every moment and um so this star you know has a bad reputation it and does it does yeah, beheadings and basically, you know, collective destruction, historic stuff like that. And yet uh, Bernadette Brady is uh, one of the astrologers who's done a lot of study of fixed stars. You know, Brady's book of fixed stars is a classic in the astrology world now. And um, she um, helps you find the most powerful ones in your own chart. But she also has revisioned this particular star as representing the rage and grief of women and traditional peoples for the repression and suppression of feminine and traditional values. And I think that's very relevant right now. 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. We were just talking about this on the um, the QPH uh, live call yesterday and an observ observation that myself and Bella made on a recent trip was just how, um, how to say, how badly women were treating women uh, from the wounded space and, and yeah. you know, projecting all kinds of envy and jealousy uh, onto people who are happy, maybe other females who have a more happier life, maybe somehow reflecting on their male partners. And it was very clear for three or four days that we went to many places and just felt this very, very strong energy of the wounded feminine projecting against yeah. other females, which of course is not going to make the situation any better. It's like, you know, if you are in a place of wounding, projecting against your fellow wounded peers or sisters is not going to resolve the situation. All it does is yeah. actually deepens it. And I feel that this is, you know, and of course the same is true with the masculine and that's a slightly different story, but I do feel that in this piece that we're now in, as the old belief systems, as the poisons of the serpent magics of the past, the very scorpionic energies are lifted out, that wounding of the feminine, but also the wounding of the feminine to the feminine is, is big. And yeah. you know, some of the reports that have come out this week paint some of the, the worst offenders of some of the worst crimes actually uh, are being women to other women, including some of the uh, previous politicians of the US. So we won't get into that now. But I think that's a big piece that's going to come up as the rebalancing of the divine yes. feminine and the sacred masculine. Yes, has exactly. to go back to a place of balance. And we can't keep saying that white males are the worst people ever to have existed and therefore everything must be our fault, which is an easy thing to say because when people like Kennedy say things like yesterday, it's just like, yeah, you're not helping any of us. But the truth of the matter is that, you know, this is a very, very personal situation for <clears throat> all of us, feminine and masculine, have both been wounded. And that yeah. needs to be resolved on both sides. And there's rather a toxic than expression on yeah. both sides. Yes, that needs exactly. To be cleared. And that's true for all of us. And, yes. you know, we're all broken hearted. You yeah. know, we're all in that grief and rage from a millennia of suppression. Right, and, exactly. And, you know, uh, if we go back far enough, we've been the oppressor. We've been the victim. We've been, <laughs> you know, so we've, we've been we've been all of the different aspects of, of these stories. And, you know, we can't judge and blame other right. people. We need to do our own healing work. And that's a very deep process. Very, very deep. Right, Kelly. Yes. And, you know, and I think two sort of points to add into this, which we've already touched on the belief systems uh, living from my wounds. Am I living from my wounded persona or am I living from a higher persona? And if we're still walking around <clears throat> expressing ourselves through our wounds, then we haven't resolved them. Yeah. So therefore, they're going to come out in these ways. So I think that's oh, yeah. And how do we how do we get past the triggering effect of our emotions, of our wounding? We have to go to the eagle's perch. How do we get there? Through the heart with the phoenix rising with the Scorpio rebirthing energy. So we have all of the energies here in this chart. Again, the arrow from the past of Scorpio. Am I living from my wounds with all of that toxicity and poison? Or am I going to let it go and allow myself to expand into Jupiter and Taurus in the North Node? You know, so I think it's really important. I just wanted to say that because it's an energy that's been appearing a lot over the last few weeks. And for sure, it's one that needs to be looked at collectively, right? Yes. Yeah, well, we've got a little bit of the triggering also. And I don't want to, I this is a little side note. Chiron and Aries it was uh, triggering Mars not long ago and right. <laughs> moving into the square. So there is here just in in the time we are in, We've had a healing of the masculine and now coming up a healing of the feminine. And we keep doing that. Yeah. And the, the other powerful feminine archetype that is on the other side, the end, the far side of the new moon is Sedna, the Inuit goddess of the Arctic Sea who lives at the bottom of this frigid, frigid dark waters. And she has a very tragic history. I don't want to tell the whole story now but she was betrayed by her husband and by her father and she tried to hold on she tried to hold on and she had to let go you know and the letting go is what we're in now and as she had to let go because she was trying to climb back onto this kayak and her father like cut her fingers off you know that that's terrible because her husband was going to like create this whirlpool of a storm and they were going to drown so there she was you know betrayed by both of her masculine you know people and she had to let go and I think uh, as I've been thinking about that uh, I've been thinking about how 
you can't depend on other people. And this, her letting go, you know, she sank to the bottom of the sea and her severed limbs became the sea creatures. That it was like a shamanic dismemberment that created new life. And in her surrender, in her letting go, these, these new life force was created. And these are, are her sea creatures that when she's honored, she has so much to do with ecology. I think pr pr probably ocean ecology or sea ecology or whatever's going on at the bottom of the sea because there are hot pockets at the bottom of the ocean where, where heat is coming up and things can be born there. You know, that's the deepest, darkest. And no wonder her Sedna was able to do that. And when the people honor her, she allows her creatures to be taken for food and sustenance of the people who live in pretty harsh conditions. So what does that mean to us? You know, when we're having to let go of the old comfort model, the old normal that, you know, part of us uh, is um, not really excited to let go of. You know, it was, you know, easy living for some, of course not for all, but, we and and our past has been obliterated in so many cases. We we've, we've forgotten, or knowledge has been taken away. And this is also, I think, part of the knowledge coming back of yeah. how to live on the earth sustainably. Learn how to grow food. How does food grow? Where does your food come from? What's in it? You know, <laughs> and we need to know these things. It's basic, basic, basic. I couldn't agree more. And I, and I think that's a lovely explanation of what you've given there. And, and you know, I've been saying for a long time about letting go of everything. And it's difficult because, you know, we have these attachments into the old paradigm. We have things like mortgages and bank balances and all of these ties that really are heavy. Um, some of them are also illegal, as we're finding out. And I'm sure that's a big part of what's to come over the next few weeks from this south node in Scorpio is what have other people been doing with our money? Right. What have they been doing with taxpayers money? Uh, you know, but as part of that, you know, the, the the way that that system has worked is through codependency, giving us a level of comfort, giving us lots of distractions so that we're distracted in our comfort so that we never really question anything. And so we maintain the status quo for the people above us who are actually doing a lot better out of it than we are. But they don't want us to see that. So I see all of these things tied together and. Letting go can be both incredibly challenging uh, in the process leading up to it, but it can also be incredibly liberating in ways that you cannot really understand until you fully let go into whatever the process is. And I'm speaking directly from lots of experiences here that sometimes jumping into the abyss without any idea what's going to happen next can be terrifying, but it can also actually be quite exciting. And in the moment, maybe like this, where our belief systems are crumbling, we're realizing that maybe many things that we've held true are lies. What do we still have to hold on to? What is our truth? What is my personal truth? What is the truth that I share with you, Kelly, or with Bella or with other people from QPH? What is the truth that hold us all together? A vision of new earth, uh, maybe of a different way of doing things. Maybe this is a time to create ground up from Taurus, new systems yeah. that suit all of us and not just the 1% or the 3% or whatever. And I feel like we're being massively encouraged this week with Jupiter moving into Taurus with this new moon in Taurus, with all of these incredibly strong energies that we are being given an incredible moment yeah. to release that arrow with these tension points of Pluto and Mars and say, I'm heading forwards now. The past is the past. We can let it go. I don't know what the future looks like, but God damn it, I'm excited about it because it can't be <laughs> any worse than the last three years of utter turgidness that we've been served up. And, you know, yeah. what's remarkable to me is people's short term memories. You know, it's very difficult to really loop back to 2020 and remember some of the things that were happening in 2020 because so many unpleasant things have happened since 2020. But I had a few loops because of some of the astrology going back to uh, January of 2020 when we had the Pluto Saturn conjunction, I think. Uh, yeah. That's and, you know, that was. Right, exactly. And so that was really in many ways the beginning of this process, which I feel with the lifting of the mandates with the World Health Organization telling us officially that something is over, you know, all of this indicates that that is the end of that piece. What comes next, I think, is what has been initiated this week already, particularly in the US, uh, which is going to have a big effect on everything uh, all over the world. And, you know, we're looking at new financial systems coming in, such as BRICS, 
um, which again was in the press today. South Africa has been very uh, prominent in its um, uh, voicing of certain opinions about certain things. Uh, and, you know, belief systems around world leaders, belief systems around what we believe about Russia, China, communism, Vladimir Putin, Xi Ping. What do we really believe about Biden? What do we really believe about any of these people? How much of it, uh, yeah. you know, what we're believing is what we've been given and we've just swallowed it. How much of it is based on any kind of direct experience? I've never met Uncle Joe. I've never met Vladimir Putin. How, how on earth can I tell anybody what they're really like? All I've got to go on is what I'm being shown on TV, which may or may not be the truth. Right. Or Trump. <laughs> or Trump even, right? You know, many people might have to eat a little bit of humble pie this week now that Mr. Trump is progressively being cleared of pretty much most things. And, you know, it's interesting, again, the uh, stuff that is thrown in the run up to some of these powerful new moons last week. Mr. Trump, if we're on that tip, was uh, facing charges from somebody who accused him of rape, which in the end wasn't agreed to. And, you know, there are many things around that and the Mr. Bragg case and blah, blah, blah. And it's going to divide many people because we don't know exactly what is the truth. I don't have personal access to the FBI records. No, or the we don't. And, we you don't. know, when you get caught up in the drama and we've got right. to watch that because there's going to be a lot of drama with Mars and Venus and the Black Moon and Leo. Finger pointing. You did it. No, I didn't. You did it. No, I didn't. You did it. I mean, I'm already Just seeing this coming back out today. To your personal situation. Right. Ground yourself, you know, get get like, you know, closer, you know. And, mm -hmm. and forget all that stuff, you know. Right. Bring it back to self. Get centered yeah. in yourself. Sure, we can we can have a bit of fun watching the TV and having a sweepstake on maybe who's going to be the first president to be arrested or blah, blah, blah. We can make fun with it, right? We can have fun with it because if we get too involved in it. No, I've had it? to pull back. I, right. I don't even. I, I can't even do much of that because I've, I've had to pull back just to <laughs> manage myself, you know. Well, it so, takes your attention into other spaces that bring that take you away from the present moment. And this when, is something when you don't know exactly what's going on, you think, you know, or you that person says what's going on. And it's like, you know, just that's too much to deal with. You know, just come back to your small life and and plant a garden, you know. Yeah, I well, got also where I see the Pluto Mars tension playing out a little bit with Pluto wanting to reveal many things. And in the moment those revelations come up, it's going to cause Martian reactions in people, either when they feel that they've been betrayed. But that, that can be the Mars and Cancer and the Venus and Cancer. Come home to yourself. Just, right. you know, let that go. Take a deep breath. You know, whew, you know, OK. You know? And then when, <laughs> then when you get pulled back in, which. We're all going to be necessarily because this is going to change our lives. <laughs> right. And in a good way. And I think, again, we have these options here, as we all say in our astrology shows, we have the high notes of the astrology, which we particularly try to focus on with the KBOs and the asteroids. And we have the lower notes of the astrology and we get to choose whether we get wrapped up in the lower note dramas the illusions the hallucinations on the tv or whether we say you know what I, i'm i'm subscribing to a different way of being which places me at the center of my universe in the center of a spiral fractal fractaling out from myself and we talked about this yesterday on, on our call to our group the most rebellious act that you can do with that banner of the goddesses hidalgo showed us is to create your own inner personal rebellion and revolution it's literally the most powerful thing you can do right now. Yeah. Because whatever you're doing here is going to naturally fractal out in that beautiful natural spiral to everything around you. And I think this is a big part of where we're at is to take that time to get centered in ourselves and start to really understand that we are powerful nuclear yeah. reactors in a toroidal field that can create in a godlike way almost anything we want. But we have to be very clear in ourselves. Yeah. Pluto is where we claim our power or we give it away. Right. <laughs> and so here it is, you know, are, are you ready? And, you know, we've got, this is the, the Jupiter Pluto is the closest square on this side. And then the Mars Haumea on this side. So, mm. you know, and the cuspiness is so interesting because there's so much transitional energy going on here, backwards and forwards, because the nodes move backwards. Haumea is moving backwards, but will be moving forwards. Pluto's moving backwards and is going to go back into Capricorn. And, you know, minutes, uh, you know, kind of a couple hours after the full moon, the moon's going into Gemini. A day or two later, the sun goes into Gemini. So there's a lot of like from fixity, a lot of movement ready to go. 
And you know, uh, it's funny you just saying that whole backwards and forwards thing. Many people have been saying over the last week, feels like I'm putting one step forwards and then one step back. And I'm not sure if I'm going anywhere. And it's like, it can feel very backwards and forwards. One minute you're feeling great. Next thing you're having a horrible moment about something. And then three hours later, you feel great again. Then you check and you realize, that, oh my gosh, there was like an X-class solar flare that hit this afternoon. Yeah. This is why I haven't been able to, excuse me. Oh, <laughs> kitty. <laughs> Just going to take my cat down. Sorry about that, everybody. She does like to make an appearance um, normally when I'm doing a podcast. So Let me show you this graphic. Um, yes. You know, just for fun. We, this is Medusa. Mm -hmm. And there she's looking pretty intense. And uh, here's, um, here I made that clay piece. That was one of my very first clay pieces, Sedna. I mean, uh, Algol or mm -hmm. Medusa. Anyway, here's Sedna by Susan Sedan Boulay. Mm. And, you know, there, there she has this. She's so far out. You know, Sedna that they are estimating 11,400 years for an orbit. And she's on the closest, she's in her coming to her closest approach. She's going into Gemini on June 15th already before this moon cycle is over, Sedna's into Gemini. And so this is another major moment because she's been in Taurus since the 1960s, I think my notes say. So sorry, let me get that correct. Sedna is going to move into Gemini when? Because she's so slow moving. Surely it must be ages away, no? Even at three degrees. No, she's moving at her fastest in ah. Gemini. Like Hidalgo moves his fastest in Gemini. Anyway, right. um, so yeah, she's I I checked it. I checked it in the event. Okay. June. I believe you. I believe you. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, sometimes I, I and this is just uh, an idea and I'm not 100 percent attached to it, but I wonder whether Sedna could be Planet X, could be Nibiru. We had the day of the cross the other day, which was very, very powerful. Uh, and I wonder whether that was the crossing of the planets. You know, there's there's been a lot of talk from many people, including us, that we can perceive in the astral realms that there is another big planet very, very close to us that is not being revealed in the 3D. I've seen it in dreams. I'm not the only person. I don't know. What is it? Is it Sedna? Is it another planet? I don't know. But I, I want to throw that out just for other people to think about, because it could be interesting. You know, 11,000 year orbit is long. And if you've ever read the 12th planet or the work of Sitchin, it could possibly be a planet such as Nibiru or Planet X. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out as a thought because it's interesting. And yeah, it's coming quite, I mean, relatively close. I mean, it's, as close it's, as it's um, What did I, where are my notes? Okay, so it's once it goes, so it's going back into Taurus from say like December into April, and then in 2024, it, uh, May it goes into back into Gemini, and it's there until I think 2066. So and it moves into Gemini on what date? Sorry, Kelly, I'm just going to make a note. Of that. Um. Oh, I did. I did find that. Wait a minute. I I can I can find it. Sedna number one. Sedna number one is, is on June 15th, and June 15th. Sedna number two is eluding me. Um, sorry June about that, 15th. but it's no, some okay. it, at the it's oh, it's April 27th or something in there, 2024. 2024, okay. Yeah, now this is exciting to me because I can relate to Sedna and earth energy and ecology, but in the air. So what is the air about? You know, we've got the Space Force now. What is what is the atmosphere about? What what is the ecology of the atmosphere and the electric electromagnetic field and the ether? So I think this is going to be more pronounced. And I also think that there by the end of that time, there's going to be interplanetary, if not interstellar communications. For sure, you know, and yeah, I just want to just loop back to something you said about the um, the Galactic Center. I uh, watched a very wonderful video yesterday with our friend Pam Gregory and Julia Ballas, where she was talking about the Galactic Center at 20, 27, 28 of Sagittarius and its importance. And for those people who have aspects uh, in, in all of uh, the Galactic Center, Neptune is going to be squaring that over the next year or so. And when I think about Neptune in Pisces and the Galactic Center, I feel like we're being offered exactly what you just said, the ability to connect to 
galactic aspects of ourselves, galactic travel, telepathy, uh, astral projection, the ability to travel across timelines without even moving from your seat. These are all abilities that some of us have been working with actually in bits and pieces with beings like Dandelion for a year or so now. And we understand that we have the ability by going inwards and understanding the avatar aspect of who we are and dropping our attachment to ourselves. All very, very Buddhist. You know, yeah. I've been doing a lot of work with the mind energies recently and I see that Buddhism and mind energy actually are very, very intrinsically linked, which I think is fascinating and probably a conversation for another time. Um, but this is yeah. this is a powerful time and uh, we have many influences that we can work with. But I, I think that if we constantly striving for those upper notes, we can start to really activate that hollow mind perceiver or cosmic human aspect of ourselves. Well, you know, if Neptune's going to square the galactic center, which is the the divine mother's you know, universal or at least galactic womb. Mm. You know, this really brings forward more of the divine feminine and the possibilities through grace and love and compassion that come in. And, you know, on Mother's Day, the moon was conjunct Neptune, which I thought was very much about the divine mother, you know, as well as any other level of mothering, motherhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, okay, we've covered quite a bit there on the full moon, and uh, hopefully our audience has got the idea, certainly from my side, that I wanted to put across, which is that this is a super powerful uh, intention setting week. Do not pass this one up, uh, folks. Uh, for sure, a lot of our attention at this end and, is very you know, much. In terms of healing your trauma, there's so much evocation of that, which is, I think, part of the stuff coming out, you know. But look at this look at this dramatic moment on the full moon you mercury is just about to conjunct uranus and wow. you know it almost conjuncted uranus and it went retrograde and it's been putting out a lot of news what's going to happen on the full moon you know so that that's pretty interesting and uh like i said earlier <laughs> we we have mars at the new moon at 29 cancer here's venus and the black moon at this far edge of cancer ready to move into leo and this is the true black moon the mean black moon which is uh you know called lilith the mean average motion is called the mean black moon mm -hmm. and it's at uh it's at 16 right now but the true black moon goes jumps ahead and goes back it's just you know, going back and forth and, you know, it's, um, it's back in cancer here being part of that ongoing T square or grand cross, right? Making the grand cross. So this is in cancer. This is like the black moon is saying, you know, sorry, but it's time to grow. You cannot stay attached to the old ways. You, again, you can't, depend on this is like grow up this is like you know forget your comfort level get excited about the growth potential and about newness and about birthing and about what how do you want to be living and this so is i'm going to ask you the question i ask you every month kelly and that hopefully i'm not putting you on the spot but do we have our black moon lilith alignment days for the yes. Month? yes we do Good. Uh, we got one on um May 27th at 16 Leo, which is where it is now. Mm -hmm. And I mean, on this full moon. And then we have one on June 16th, but that's in the, in the, that's, yeah, that's, I think the next new moon is on the 18th, 19th. So it's just before the next new moon. So we have two in this moon cycle. Yeah, and we, the second one is on what degree? Monday. We had one on Monday the 15th, also, by the way. Oh, wow. Yeah, I so think a lot of stuff that happened this week already. <laughs> yeah. And to remind people, we're talking about the mean black moon, you know, and the difference between the mean black moon and the true black moon can be up to 30 degrees. You can have black moon Lilith in two different houses and two different signs. It can be quite an experience. But when they come together and the frequency is not as wide, it's more like this. This is like a zero point energy on a mm. deep level that's not maybe obvious, but it's like the soul calling you. 
It's like, be here with me, Do, be this. This is what you be. This is, this is your true self. So also that's to me, I'm all in all about the divine mother at the moment. Maybe that's because my moon is in cancer as well. Uh -huh. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's um, her, her call. It's like her call. So just to uh, emphasize that, so, and to, to clarify, we have uh, what we call the Black Moon Lilith Alignment Days. I think that's the sort of the yeah. phrase that I've um, come up with, and I mark them in my diary now, and it's why I always ask you on these shows, because they're super powerful, and they're a kind of a zero point. They're a bit like an eclipse, I think. They're a portal through which we can call in galactic energies that we have connections with, which is where some of the uh, cosmic stuff, I think, yeah. is really going to start to come through. And you gave me the date uh, being May the 27th at 16 degrees of Leo and June the 16th. And do you have the, the placement of that one, Kelly, where it is? Uh huh. Yeah, that's 17, Leo. Oh, it's the 17, Leo. OK. Wow, yeah. which is now, right around my said, Saturn. <laughs> that's like an eclipse. And, you know, the, there's the nodes of the moon do the same thing. They're related to the Earth Moon cycle, and there's the mean north, the mean nodes, and the true nodes, but they're only a couple of degrees apart. This is a a still part of the intimate aspect of the Earth Moon system, mm. but it has this wider range of motion that is like weaving. You know, there's the mean, but there's the the true is bringing in a little cancer to the Leo. It's going back and forward and is bringing a little Virgo in. And so it's weaving, you know, it's making connections. It's threading our way forward. Wow. And, you know, what I think is interesting is that Black Moon Lilith is conjunct Venus. So it's quite different aspects of feminine energy you have any comments on that at all yes this is one of the things i talk about in a in one of my popular talks which is about the the cosmic feminine three aspects of the moon venus and black moon lilith and how they they're the dance of the this kind of triple goddess but they're different aspects of the divine feminine <laughs> and it sounds like it could be, you know, a kind of evolutionary from moon to Venus to black moon. And in some ways, I think consciousness develops that way, but not always. You know, some people tune into the black moon really early in life. And um, <laughs> so, um, you know, when we get Venus and the black moon, it's not just about personal happiness, which v v Venus is a lot about our emotional intelligence our sense of self-worth and self-love that allows love to radiate from us and come back to us. And, you know, it's the personal essence of our divine self that has more of the personal touch. The black moon is more um, objective. It is as it is. And it wants your soul to be alive and uh, uh, aware. So, it's not, this is combination is not about your comfort level in cancer or, or even your personal happiness. It's about your soul alignment. Right. And, you know, you just said there, uh, obviously the, the three aspects with the, the moon. And so of course we have the moon involved in this as well with the nodes in this, uh, this grand cross and, and they're being squared right by, um, yes but by uh, Black Moon, Lilith and Venus. So this is a very lunar feminine They're energy. They're about to be, right? When they go into Leo. Right. And Mars, you know, Mars is leading the way. Venus goes in two days after this full moon. And the, you know, this is the, the true Black Moon. So it's going to be, it, it can move real quick when it's ready to move. <laughs> so, and, and this is what I'm, of course, conjuncting Regulus, right? Regulus is at 29 Leo. 29 so this is 27 and 28 leo so it's within cancer this is sorry cancer. in cancer my bad my bad cancer but it's uh, the cuspy uh, place between the sign ruled by the moon and the sign ruled by the sun uh, so that mm. you know it's it's um and it's a very subjective sign you know and so the black moon is a little touchy in there you know mm, it's mm. like you know, the subjective doesn't work here. Sorry, it is as it is. Don't take it personally, you know, and don't stay attached. You know, this is this is tuning into the divine feminine, to the soul force, the soul power, the, the womb that has that soul spark and has all the memory of all your lifetimes. And you don't want to be stuck there. We don't want to be stuck. 
in the past or you know kind of maintain attachments that don't further our growth this is a lot about furthering our collective growth as well as our individual growth so and we all make a contribution when we work along those lines right and the other interesting thing talking about that is that the full moon is conjunct the great attractor at uh which i think oh, is yeah. leaves of sag so this is all about our soul journey attracting uh, the energies to us that we need and you know we've just been i think we're still in the uh, mayan wave spell of the magnetic human which is about attracting the things to us uh, well sometimes we magnetize things to us we don't want and um, because we haven't got ourselves aligned properly or whatever but i feel that we've been given again the opportunity here to attract uh to us through magnetizing ourselves ah. the things that we need right. And it goes back to like that arrow, that pointed arrow. You know, exactly. we need to be one pointed. That's where we're going. Yeah. And 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 follow up. You know, don't second guess yourself. You know, Sagittarius has such a good intuition. It just knows things. And right. if there's Gemini that can second guess it. How do you know that? You know, <laughs> no, 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 doubting. You know, kind of energy. So that's one of the um, challenges of this particular you know, um, uh, polarity. And, and I think, sorry guys, I was just gonna say, I think a lot of the motif at the moment is about being present in the moment so that yeah. you get very clear about what is it that your soul or your higher self has fated for you? What is your destiny? And are you living in alignment with that destiny? Or are you doing a more Luciferian approach, which is going left and right, doing everything but what you should be doing, uh -huh. and probably creating well, a lot of bad karma for yourself in the process? <laughs> about the heart, Leo, that increasing Leo energy is about the heart, and the Black Moon is, is there as well. And there's a lovely fire trine between the moon and Chiron, which is oh, yeah. the be here now factor. And because um, if you're not here now, you're not in alignment with spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical. Um, and then Mars in Leo there. So that's a very nice trine full of fire and confidence and energy. And um, so the, the challenge to this moon is particularly indicated by Orcus. And we have talked about Orcus before. You know, the cycles keep moving along and there's a threading from one to the other, you know, and Ooh. some things come back into position again. And Orcus is the Etruscan god of the underworld who's about the oaths of the soul. And this is very much, he's the soul maker, the soul breaker, and the soul, uh, the oath keeper. So what oaths are or agreements are you, you need to sift through them here in Virgo, sift and sort and see which ones are toward your growth and which ones are keeping you back, which ones are hampering you, are blocking you, because this can be a block when, a, um, you know, right between the moon and the sun. This is like something we really got to look at. It also goes back to nature and tuning into your body and what feels right and what is organic, that organic intelligence of every cell in your body and any processes you know to do that are about breaking agreements. Sometimes we don't even know we made them. We don't know we still have them. Um, some of them are collective, you know, and some of these we need to break in order to move more freely into this new era. So that's also part of the healing process of not feeling guilty. You know, it's like breaking those agreements that aren't good for either party. You know, we need some of that Pisces forgiveness, you know, and, and, and again, the letting go. So we're not dragging stuff with us. And the body doesn't want to hold it either. And you know what? I'm just thinking in relation to what you said about, um, you know, the soul and the soul's journey. And we have soul contracts often with family members or people that we meet along the way, soul family members, you know, and that's, I think, a big part of the piece to come. And, you know, again, if we have that ability to go to the eagle's perch to a fifth dimensional uh, non-dualistic view we can see all of these soul contracts for what they are in, in the duality of our existence here in the earthly realm 
And from that position, it's much easier to make non less emotional triggered decisions about things because we see the contracts for what they are and whether they've served their purpose. Uh, and sometimes, you know, the, the soul contracts may seem like challenging ones where people have it in for you over something, but they're trying to show you something yeah. through a soul contract. I've, I've had that with some of my uh, teachers in the past, uh, you know, in various ways. And I, I now understand some of their actions completely differently because I've been able to go to an Eagle's Perch perspective and see the bigger, more soulful shamanic perspective that uh, mm. particularly my Amazonian teacher was trying to show me at one point. Uh, and sometimes that can only be revealed with maturity, with time and with hindsight. Yes. Uh, and I feel that now, I mean, this is funny because this is completely conjunct my descendant. <laughs> uh, and it feels like I'm looking at this from my own perspective, being uh, asked to review uh, internally all of those big soul contracts that I may have carried from other lifetimes, yeah. which is a process I'm actually already in, funnily enough. And you you sometimes as a three dimensional avatar that is Kelly or David in this moment are actually carrying the weight of many other avatar expressions of our higher self from other timelines, other narratives. And there is the temptation, because I've done this myself, to think, oh, my God, like, why am I picking up the mess for all of you sods who didn't do your work properly? And then there's the understanding as well, because you're the one who's been gifted with the realisation that you're going to be able to do it and you're going to get the benefits from what your other aspects of yourself were never able to do. So basically suck it up, buddy, and, and start getting on with the job. And, you know, I think that we can take that much more non-dualistic view of things and have a little bit of fun with ourselves and say, hey, I got to remember, I signed up to all of this. I agreed to come out, down here and do this. So there's got to be a good reason why I would do that. My higher self is not going to kind of perpetually uh, submit me to a lot of suffering unless I have some horrific karma. Uh, but I would suggest all the people that have that level of horrific karma are already somewhat either rounded up or have already met their fate oh. over the last few years. So I think that, you know, and the, we the, can't the, judge the, them either. You know, no, we, we, can't. we can't, that holds us back. That exactly kind of judgment. Right. You know, and it's um, difficult not to, right, Kelly, in duality, because uh, we have the yeah, in duality, the in the Exactly. But we don't want that duality. We want the oneness. We're heading to the yeah. oneness. You know, what you said about family agreements and contracts, that's specifically indicated by Orca squaring the moon. Well, there we go. And, and in Sagittarius, that goes back to belief systems, you know, and we often grow up in a certain religious tradition or cultural mm. context, and a lot of the shapes are beliefs. And so that that's uh, that's part of this. And um, yeah, we need to be really open minded with that Gemini curious, curious cat sign, you know, open minded, and I'll listen to it. But I've got, you know, I I'm I'm heading in this direction. And I, I, I am following my truth, my sense of the truth. Uh, so that's really um, that fire that, that uh, mm -hmm. it's a, a very active here. There's a lot of movement, a lot of optimism and visionary uh, possibilities here on this full moon. And uh, when we let go of some of those contracts and belief systems, the world does open up and we're heading right to the great attractor, did you say? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I think that's a really good point because, you know, with the intentions we put on the new moon in Taurus, which can be really powerful, two weeks later, they can come to a place of illumination. And if we still have those, let's just say, um, uh, what's the word the phrase I'm looking for? Those contracts, those soul contracts, whether with our existing blood family or maybe even our soul family, tribal members, those contracts are no longer service. They've served their purpose. They've shown us where we needed to do work. Then we can say, okay, thank you very much for the other people, person involved in the contract. I feel like this has served its purpose now. Now we can both let it go and allow our connection, relationship, whatever it is, to evolve to a different space. And I think... Right. We can make new contracts or new agreements based on the new energy. New earth energy. We can, we can view the people that maybe we had tensions with in the past, particularly family members, and saying, I've risen above that. I've done my Phoenix process. I'm now sat proudly on my eagle's perch, able to see myself and my own actions in interacting with other people and I now choose to be in a place of compassion and forgiveness and for all of the things that have hurt me in the past but those things no longer serve me anymore they've all served their purpose nice. they've shaped me but now I'm letting go into a new space and I think letting go for the love to come through and for a new uh, uh like agreement like you know the, yeah. the a justice a a sharing 
Um, and I love this, you know, I love the Taurus in this, in this full moon uh, with Jupiter, like so close to the node, they've already conjuncted. And, and so this is, this is bringing forth uh, a lot of abundance and goodness and productivity. Uh, this is really a beautiful combination here. Um, and that's what we're heading for. And then we've got that Mercury conjunct Uranus. So it's going to be wild times. <laughs> big then... star there, like pay attention to this. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, I didn't want to use one of these other lines. And I, okay, like we got to pay attention to that. We have to make sure because mm. that is going to open our minds and our experience to new levels, new opportunities. That's one of my favorite Jupiter words, amplification and opportunity. So this is really opening the doors to where we want to be heading and making it more possible. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, I know we're not going to talk about it today, but it's it's going to approach soon. Jupiter will, of course, conjunct Uranus in the not too distant oh, future. So next that's got to be a kind of an interesting one, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it's next April or May, I forget, but it, it's, yeah. Yeah, and that's going to be the... fireworks. The movement of Taurus, uh, sorry, the movement of uh, Jupiter in Taurus and Uranus already been quite late. I imagine that conjunction is going to come quite late in the um, Taurus sign. Yeah, right? I did look that up and it too, is, but I didn't write it down. Um, it's like, say, like third week in April next year. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, and it, there's also a total, a total solar eclipse that month. <laughs> Of course there is. <laughs> then we'll have the Uranus conjunction. <laughs> That'll wow. be wild times in the old town yeah. tonight. Isn't that interesting as well that, you know, if we look back to a few years ago, many astrologers, maybe even yourself, Kelly, uh, wow. would have said that April, March, April, spring 24 was kind of where many people started to perceive that we might be starting to elevate out of the process that we've been in for the last few years. So I'm wondering if that's another stepping stone in that process. Yes, you know, I just noticed that that eclipse at 19 and a half Aries is conjunct Chiron at 19 Aries. Wow. Wow. And then we have the Jupiter Uranus conjunction like a couple of weeks later. Holy spot. Uh, so put it in your diaries, folks. April 24 is another one of those benchmarks that we should have in our awareness because, you know, this yeah. is a very staged piece. And I think that, you know, as I've been learning more about astrology over the last few years, particularly from yourself and Pam over the last couple of years, you know, it's become very apparent to me that there's a beautiful choreography yeah. that happens that, you know, the, the, yeah. it's, and the more this is the quantum aspect, right? The deeper we look, the more we see. And it's the more we see, the deeper and we look. more exquisite and nuanced. I've been noticing that over the last several years. And this year right. is, well, last year was amazing. And this year is like, wow, these lunations are like really rocking it. <laughs> right, exactly. So, okay, well, look, let's take um, the chart down, Kelly, and we'll just wrap things up because we're already, uh, as we always are, over our hour limit by a few minutes. And uh, we always have so much to talk about. Uh, just to share a little uh backstage secret we always try to do an hour for our shows and we always end up doing an hour and 10 minutes so hopefully you always find those charts. we're looking at two charts with all this stuff going on so what do you think you know so um, if you're hanging in there with us uh, it have been or well, pieces you know? exactly and this is i think with the point with the choreography is that the more that we bring in the different threads and the more that we can relate them to our own personal charts the more we give ourselves and all of you guys listening the opportunity to find your thread. And certainly um, here at QPH, we've been working certain astrological threads now for over a year or so, and seeing how we can keep looping back and keep working the energies, but you have to choose the one that works for you. And I think that that's maybe one of the places we're heading to in astrology at a more collective level is understanding how we can work our own astrological threads and pathways through moons, eclipses, black moon, Lilith days, whatever really resonates with our chart. Yeah. I think that's part of the journey that we're going on with the astrology right now to elevate it to the higher notes to look more at fixed stars to look at stellar nations to look more at centaurs kbos well Astral. isn't that part of uh, uh pluto going into aquarius the the I wider so. world the wider mm. cosmos the the yeah. more collective energies and uh that higher mind and energy coming in 
Not right. to say, give up your moon. <laughs> <laughs> so look, um, just before we wrap up in the last couple of minutes, Kelly, is there anything you'd like to add as a conclusion to looking at the two, uh, the, the two moons of the next uh, cycle? Is there anything you, you'd like to say in uh, sort of conclusion? I, I'm just, now we got to go live it. <laughs> We've looked yeah. at it. Now we got to go live it <laughs> and live it right. at your best. And, you know, Venus is a really good ally. Uh, and so is Jupiter. Jupiter is right. about wisdom and Venus is about love and aesthetics and joy. You know, let's walk the beauty path together. Love it. Love it. Um, totally agree. I think the energy of Jupiter right now is, is one that we can all work with. Certainly it's very much in my awareness with this, uh, with this new moon on Friday. And, you know, I feel like we've, we've now, you know, just to share a small piece about three or four weeks ago, I did a, a strong medicine journey and I saw very clearly in the astrals that the edifice, the structure had completely collapsed, uh, much to the surprise uh, of the people that were holding up the edifice, how quickly it collapsed was almost instant. I saw a huge amount of angelic energy around the time we did the Hidalgo piece actually, which was part of that sweep across the planet and the whole thing got demolished in one go. There has been a period of shock waves that have followed since, but I feel that this week is the first process or the first time since that happened, where suddenly the forces of the light, the light workers, those of us who've been following this for a while, suddenly have the first hint of freedom. Actual freedom is coming. We're starting to, to rebuild more seriously. I think we've had to see a collapse. And as we yeah. know, the, the, the visuals in the 3D from the Ash will take a few weeks to play out. But I think that what we're seeing with the news this week already, particularly in the US, is the demolishment of the old system. When you have leaders of the biggest nations on the planet uh, being accused of corruption at a deep level and weaponizing the political system against the people, tells me that you're ready for a change. And you know whether it's one country or multiple countries, I think the lid is about to come off all of that, which is good because it means that the system has collapsed and we can now actually feel free energetically to start being sovereign again. So I uh, just want to, again, um, give Kelly the opportunity to share her website and where you can get her wonderful books okay. on Black Moon Lilith. Yeah, it's uh, www.heliastar.com, H-E-L-I-A, the female sun energy, heliastar.com. Brilliant. Thank you, as always, Kelly. And I just want to take the final opportunity to, again, point to the lovely video that I watched again for the first time since we did it yesterday, actually, the video on, on Centaur Asteroid 944, aka Hidalgo, who's very, very connected to everything we've just talked about. Yes, uh, the point. warrior. I mean, that, that's a very cool you know, combo there. With the, the goddess as his banner, but also yeah. with his astrology and the astrology of all the things we looked at is all very much around two degrees of Scorpio, uh, which I think is very interesting, particularly if you have uh, that in your charts. Uh, um, and as Julia talked about in the video with Pam, which I do recommend checking, there is the, I think it's called the Shapley Attractor at two degrees of Scorpio, which is super powerful and obviously very, very much in effect with everything that is going on with these moons. So just to point towards that. And also, as I alluded to earlier, finally at QPH, we are going to be releasing um, a long anticipated and awaited uh, workshop on magic and manifestation because it's really working a lot with the astrology, a lot with the energy of Jupiter. And we're gonna be releasing that on Friday uh, at the QPH website. So uh, please- Does, does everybody that. know that QPH is quantum plant healing? Just to say that, thank you, Kelly. Yes, QPH, aka quantumplanthealing.com is the uh, the organization community website that myself and my partner Bella set up uh, about a year ago, working with our wonderful friend Dandelion. So we're also coming around to many deltas and anniversaries. So this feels like a, a resetting moment, a liftoff moment, a chance to really express what's in our hearts, work with the energy of Jupiter and the goddess and live it. I love it. Love it, live it, live it, love it. You know, uh, that's the best way to do anything. And I think most of all, as me and Kelly were talking about beforehand, have fun. If it's yeah. not fun, don't and do it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you, as always, to my wonderful uh, erudite uh, co-host, Kelly Hunter. And thank you to everybody who's listened in today for our 10th anniversary celebration. We will be doing a much more uh, powerful 13th day celebration because that'll be the 13th moon of Moons and Moons. <laughs> So that's going to be a little bit spooky and witchy, I think, if I know me and Kelly at all. So look forward to that in a few months' time. But uh, as always, keep it real. And as Bella would say, keep it empty, um, because if we keep the space empty, then we can receive the light coming in. Have fun, everybody, and see you next time. Ciao for now.